So this morning we're going to be answering questions but begin at beekeeping. So if you're new to beekeeping, you've got questions, now's the time. No such thing as a silly question. We're also going to be harvesting honey from this hive today as well. You can see the bees are busy in here. There's not a whole lot of honey around at the moment. So we're just going to harvest one frame of honey and leave the rest for the bees. And to do that, we're taking the little cap out of the top here. You can use this little tongue to take the one out of the bottom. That's a handy little tip. And you poke the tube in like that, jar underneath, and then we're all set to go. So all I'm going to do is turn this handle like this and to a 90. It can be quite firm to turn that handle because what's happening is you're creating channels inside the honeycomb. So depending on the, the how much wax and propolis they've used to join all the flow frame parts together that will determine how easy or hard it is to turn this handle. So you can do it in segments so it makes it a lot easier like that and then away you go. And just leave it in that right angle position like that and that way if any of the parts are still moving to create those channels they get a little bit of time to do that. And pretty soon we'll see some honey coming down the tube. If you've got questions, put it in the comments below. We're here to answer any questions about bees, beekeeping, flow hives, and hopefully it will uh, help you um, drop any fears you've got about, about beekeeping and inspire you to um, start in this wonderful world of beekeeping. You can see the honey coming down the tube right now. It's uh, a beautiful, beautiful thing to watch and you can see it on video so many times but people say actually experiencing that in person is such a joy. Look at that beautiful honey from the bees. They've been doing that extraordinary work of flying out to perhaps even, even 50 million flowers in a day and bring that nectar and their pollen back to the hive and doing their magic work of creating this honey that we can share in too. Any questions? Yeah, there's a question coming in. Um, this was actually from an email from Sue from Streaky Bay. Um, she's in South Australia. She's just wondering, Cita, how much honey she should you leave in her super for her bees for winter? Okay, South Australia does get quite cold, so you do need to leave some honey for your bees. After all, they're storing this honey so that they can use it as an energy source to keep them alive, to keep the hive warm during the winter time or flowers. So, so it is important to, to leave enough honey. Now, the information on that will come from your local beekeepers, how much you need to leave and get a few opinions because the opinions, like all things in beekeeping, will vary. But basically, if you're got experiencing a long cold winter, and especially in those regions that have um, snow and, and uh, are really quite cold, then it's generally you'll need to leave a whole box of honey for them to survive the winter. And in, uh, if you're finding that your bees haven't stored any honey, you may actually need to feed them prior to winter to give them those stores. Okay, that jar's filling up. Yeah, it's coming out quite quick. I expected with this, it's quite a cold morning. It's been a really cold night, but because the bees keep the hive warm, the honey in the middle of the hive here is actually quite warm. So what I'm gonna do is just swap that jar over and fill up another one. And it's amazing to see how much honey comes out of a hive and just how beautiful it is. It's just ready for the table. It's tiny little bubbles in there. It's wonderful. Any more questions? Don't be afraid to ask. It's um it's sometimes a bit a bit, it's a bit nervous to ask questions, especially if you think they're questions that might be obvious to beekeepers already and so on. But what this Facebook stream is about is actually answering those questions that you're afraid to ask. So put them in the comments and Trace, who uh, you might recognize if you've phoned the um, office at all, will be reading those questions out and we will um, answer them as we go. 
going to have to taste that because it is so good. I'm going to put it on a mint leaf, which is quite a delicacy, <laughs> mint and honey. Yeah, that's um, a nice thing to do for breakfast. <laughs> nice. So maybe I can, there's just a little shout out here to Bianca, who's also one of our awesome customer support team, for Kathy saying thanks for her fallen comb. She used the rubber band method that Bianca told her about and it all worked really well. Oh good, excellent, yep. excellent. So that's, that's getting a little bit more advanced, but um, what they're talking about there is if you've um, got a situation where you're taking bees out of a wall or perhaps you've started a brood box and the bees have gotten a little, a little messy with their comb making because in the brood box here they're just building their natural um, comb hanging it from the wooden frames and if they go a bit wonky um, and you don't catch it early enough what happens is you need to get them back online using some rubber bands and things. Okay, keep those questions coming in. Also, let us know whereabouts in the world you are tuning in from. It's um, quite interesting to us. We've got, we've got uh, Flow Hub beekeepers in 130 countries and it's amazing to actually have um, that global audience and learning from each other and how, how people do things in one country really differs from another. So, so um, it's fantastic. Let us know where you are. We've got um, Danielle, this was from an email question. Um, they're living in New York and just wondering how to insulate the bees. Uh, mentioned stacking hay bales, would that work? Not quite sure, I guess, on the outside. Now that's an interesting idea, I haven't yeah. heard of that. So whether to insulate a hive for winter or not is a bit of a debated topic in beekeeping. You find some beekeepers will say, no, no, you just wouldn't box like this, dig it out of the snow and they're fine um, and others say you should wrap the hive up and keep them warm and so on other beekeepers even bring their hives in inside um, well into a, into a shed or something like that so so there's varying different opinions on what to do the main thing to do is make sure they have enough honey stores to eat because the bees can keep themselves warm if they have honey stores However, hay bales is an interesting idea if you do plan to insulate your hive. I guess there's no reason why you couldn't build a little hay bale house around your hive. Um, let me know how it goes. Send me a picture. <laughs> Great, and Alison um, Cedar, she's in Australia and she's got two dogs and she's just wondering, are there any precautions she should take with the arrival of their bees? Okay, so so dogs can get curious and they can come up and stick their shiny wet nose right in the front of the beehive and if they do that they're likely to cop a sting the the uh, hive tends to to go oh that's that's a bear <laughs> and, uh, coming to eat the honey and the hive will naturally defend itself so just as us we shouldn't stick our our nose or our fingers in the entrance of the hive because that's where the bees are actively defending and if if your, your dogs do that, they might get a sting and it'll probably be the last time they do do that. However, if you don't want that situation to happen or you're worried about your, your dog's reactions, then um, what you can do is just make it so the front, front of the hive isn't accessible to, to the dog just by, by um, using some fencing or positioning it in a way where it's not likely that the dog can get there. That nice wet nose. <laughs> James Taylor, I don't know if it's the singer from Janjuk, Victoria, his bees are starting to go up into the super but haven't stored any honey yet. Should he take the super off for winter or leave it on? Okay, if they haven't stored any honey in it, the winter's, the winter's just about uh, uh, here now, so uh, it'd be a good idea to take that off. The bees will, will stay warmer for the winter and they, it's generally advised that um, you take the supers off in really cold regions, especially if the, they're, they're empty. Um, 
oh, we've got a few call-outs from Las Vegas, India. Phil Clark, um, he's told it's a good time to add the flow frames on top of the brood box when the brood box is 80% populated. Would you agree with that? Generally, we say all of the frames should be drawn. So if, if you're putting your brood frames in here, they just look like a wooden frame. Some people put foundation in, some don't. But then whichever method you're using, the bees add their wax and build out the hexagon shapes and start using them for brood and storing honey and pollen. And the time to put your super on is when they've finished all of those combs and it's called drawn. When they've drawn all of those combs, on all of the frames and there's lots of bees in the box. We actually uh, covered that topic a few, a few videos back if you want to have a look at what that looks like. It's um, yeah, a good idea to make sure they're nice and full with bees before putting your super on. That way it's just a bit less room for the bees to look after, it's easier for them to keep it warm. Generally if you have a massive empty hive with a tiny colony it just makes it a bit harder for them. In the warmer climates, it doesn't matter so much, it's more in those cool places. Great. Stephen Mack um, got quite a big question. He's a brand new beekeeper and installed a pack almost a month ago. Uh, the queen was quite small, but she was there and the frames were slowly being filled out. But after the first week, they've found no honey and now cannot find the queen. Um, the question is, can, can um, he assume that the queen may not have been mated and he'd bought a pack and assumed that the queen had been mated? Um, there's, there's quite a few things that could happen there, but often it's easy to miss the queen. So what I'd do first is look for evidence of the queen by looking really closely down the cells to see if there's any eggs or larvae. So the eggs will look like a tiny little grain of rice. If you wear glasses, you'll need your glasses on to see that. And you'll need to position the frame in such a way that the light is falling down the little hexagon cells and showing that egg in the bottom. You'll need to shake some of the bees off in order to be able to see that. And uh, just be careful with the frames if you're using naturally drawn frames because the combs will be quite delicate in the beginning before they've really connected them around. So that means when you're looking at the frame, try not to tilt it over too much. And when you shake it, not too hard because you don't want that comb to drop out if they're just getting started on those frames. But you're looking for the tiny little egg down the bottom of the cells or the, the, the young larvae or a crescent moon to see whether you have a laying queen still. If you don't have a laying queen, you'll need to order one in the mail, which in most parts of the world you can do that, or go to another hive, take out a frame that's got bee eggs or young larvae on it, put it into your hive, and the bees could then raise a queen from that. So, so um, that's what you'll need to do. Chances are that she's still in there and she'll start laying and, you'll, um, and when there's a honey flow, they'll start building up from there. Great. Erin Williams is asking, just wondering the hive you're standing in front of their cedar, what, what we've used to actually coat it with? So this is, this is a linseed oil that we've coated this with. And um, it's actually one that's got a solvent in it. So it's soaked in rather than forming a skin on the hive but there's lots and lots of products you can use if you're wanting a really long lasting coating then the decking products seem to last the longest if you're um, if you want uh, or painting it with an outdoor house paint I just love watching the honey go into the jar it's the way it swirls and streams It's a beautiful thing. Simone is asking, Cedar, they started to feed their bees a sugar syrup and there was a lot of water in the bottom of the tray. Is this the result of the bees dehydrating the syrup? She's, uh, they're calling from Adelaide Hills. Okay, probably not. It's more likely to be it rained and sometimes the rain can blow right in the front of the entrance 
and fall into the tray. So simply clean out your tray by pulling it out and tipping it out and putting it back in and that water should go away. So what they're talking about here is the, the pest management tray down the bottom. So that's under here and you can pull it out and you get all sorts of debris building up but you also get some water sometimes if it's been raining a lot. Amanda's asking, after collecting all the honey uh, from the super, is there anything you need to do to prepare the frames for the bees to start using it again? The great thing is, if the frames are staying in the hive, the bees do everything to look after them. So it's, um, you do need to put the key in the top position and turn the handle to reset all the frame parts into the cell formed position. But other than that, the bees will, will do their amazing work of, of tearing off the cappings and coating all the cells in wax and making sure the hexagons are all formed and then storing their nectar and the whole process starts again. It was a bit of a wild card when we were inventing. We, we, my father and I spent a decade mucking around with all sorts of different methods and some of them were quite elaborate with, with sections of capping uh, on the front of the, the frame would move away. And, um, and then come back again and all sorts of things. But in the end, we didn't need to do that. The bees actually somehow recognize that underneath their wax capping is, is no honey and they should therefore chew that capping away and then uh, away they go from there. Quite a win, really. <laughs> There's a few people, Cedar, one, I, maybe it's not appropriate, someone wants you to take the roof off and have a look at the inner cover, but you've got all your jars, and then another person's wanting to know if you'd, you could actually take out one of the flow frames for them to have a look at. Ah, okay. Um, I wasn't planning to do a hive inspection today, so I haven't come down with my bee suit or anything. Um, this hive here, we've recently put a super on, so we could probably get away with, with peeking in that. There's not a whole lot of activity in the top yet. So um, there's the, the inner cover you can see there, and there's a little plug in the top, and if I take it off, there shouldn't be too many bees in that area. It's a little bit of um, condensation, it's been quite a a cool night and the uh, flow frames themselves let's just have a little wee look at one of the frames since you've asked I'll take out this frame here a couple of bees on the bottom and you can see right down in the bottom they've actually started to join the cells together with their wax at the bottom and they're using old wax they've recycled some wax from the hive you can tell by the way it's brown I don't know if you can get that angle. You can see that down the bottom of the cells. So they're just starting the process of preparing these frames for to store nectar in. On the other side, we, um, we put a couple of blobs of burr comb because that was one thing we were covering. And you can see by the way here, they've actually grabbed that burr comb and they've distributed it around in this area. And they're, they're using and recycling that wax. So that's one thing you can do if you want to experiment and hurry them up if you're getting impatient. But the best thing to do is just to wait till there's a good nectar flow and your bees will build up and start working them. So that's just burr comb scraped from the bottom box. If we have a look at some of the centre um, frames, then there might be some more activity on them. Not really yet. Oh yeah, a little bit more. You can see a lot more pieces have been joined between the cells at the bottom but we really don't have much of a nectar flow at the moment so we're not expecting expecting them to really start working these till the flowers start flowering hopefully we'll be soon a couple of hive beetles getting around there you can see these little beetles there um, can be a menace in your hive when the hive's weak it's a good idea to activate your pest management tray at the bottom. That one's gone up my sleeve. <laughs> um, and catch some of those beetles because when a hive's weak, you want to make sure that those little beetles don't take over. 
Okay. Um, perhaps you wanted to see how the mechanism worked. I'm not sure, but um, what I could do is show you that now. If I get this uh, key from here, and what I'll do is let's put some bees on that frame. If, if you have a look down these cells here, and you get um, line it up so you can see hexagons, that's good. And what I'm going to do, keep an eye on this section here, is I'm going to move this section to form channels instead of instead of uh, being cells, just by inserting the key. And when I turn it, have a look at what happens. So now you can see this section here, these zigzagging channels where the honey can flow down to the top at the bottom and out. And over here, they're still in cell form position. So that's how the invention works. And it works really nicely. It's amazing that you can harvest so much honey from a single hive. And go back again. There we go. Fantastic. Cedar, um, with the honey coming out now of the channel, just want a few people wondering, do you, do, do you need to clean that channel? Because now that the bees can't get in there, where the honey's coming out on the flow frame? So, do you need to clean this channel? In here? Yeah, yeah where the honey's yeah. coming in the bottom of the flow Look, frame. Generally not but sometimes so and it depends a little bit on how often you go and have a look at your hive i'm not seeing it here but sometimes you can get in the situation where there's a little leak back point which gets blocked now we've tried to design it with we had we had spent a lot of time thinking about a lot of things and one little thing you can see down at the bottom here is a little gap that looks like gee their manufacturing wasn't very good they've left a little gap but that gaps on purpose and it's there because sometimes you get a few drips of honey coming into the frames or after you're finished you might not want to wait around for the very last drops so you can put this cap back in and there's little ridges on it and it allows the bees tongues which you can actually see there if you look closely the, the bees tongues are licking up into that area and that means any remaining drops go back to the bees to reuse. But of course, bees will be bees and they'll use their wax and propolis to block up that area. And if that happens and some honey is, is um, seeping into that trough area, then it can build up. And if it's left there for too long in a humid climate, it could ferment. Or in a, in a dry climate, it could actually go candied in that area. So if it's gone fermented, then you, a good idea to clean that out prior to harvest. So um, it's uh, not that hard to do. You can just put a, a, uh, a cloth, a clean dishcloth on, on the key, put it in here and give it a little clean. But generally, you don't have to. Cedar, how much honey do you think you're going to get out of this one flow frame? I think we'll probably get about, um, looking at it, I can see the streams slowing down. It does vary frame to frame depending on how much the bees have drawn their comb out further than the, the flow frame parts. And this looks like we're going to get probably uh, perhaps another jar after this one. one. So that'll be six of these jars out of one frame. Sometimes you can get seven or eight, but um, often it's around six of these jars, which is about two liters of honey or three kilograms of honey. Just 2.2 liters, or so equals three kilograms of honey. So honey is uh, quite a lot heavier than water, and that's why it sinks to the bottom of your teacup when you put honey in your tea. This is, um, we've got a question from Kelly Thompson. She's just up the road at Rabina, actually on the Gold Coast, and she's just recently purchased a flow hive too. Um, she's getting six uh, frames full of bees ready to install. She's had got them five days ago. 
the, the woman that she's purchased them off has said to her to keep them in the box that she's got them in for two weeks before moving them across to her flow hive. She also said to put waxed frames on either side to keep them warm and feed every second day over winter. Would you agree with that? It's, um, it's not too bad advice. Um, I think that uh, you could go either way, I would say, but um, it's a nice idea to follow advice from local beekeepers that are, that are able to help you because um, then you can, you can then um, build that relationship and no doubt you'll have more questions. Um, you, you can do either, in my opinion. You could leave the hive there for a week before installing. So um, what Kelly's talking about is a, a nucleus. So a nucleus is a hive about half of one of these boxes full of frames. It's a going little hive. It's sometimes made out of core flute um, plastic material and other times it's made out of wood. But it's the easiest way to get started is you order one of these from a bee breeder. You then can move it to your location and transfer those frames into your brood box, look after your bees and they'll grow from there. Now, whether or not you transfer them straight away or leave it for a week, the most important thing is to position them where you want the hive because as soon as you let those bees out, they will, they will geolocate to that location. They have incredible memories and incredible um, use of navigation. And if you then decide, no, actually I want it over there, you'll have to, you'll have to employ a few moving your hive techniques in order to move it from there to there without really confusing and losing a bunch of bees. So I think we've run oh, out jars. of jars. We're gonna have to use a cup. We're going to have to uh, <laughs> put some honey and tea instead. Um, okay. Thank you. That's okay. We can have honey yeah. in tea. Nice. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Cedar a question Wonderful. coming in. Um, from a new beekeeper, just just they just want to have one flow hive, or but they're just concerned that that then they might need a second or third hive, and they've only got a small backyard. How do you just stop it so you can just keep the one hive and not keep having to ha add extra hives? So generally, people are really happy to come and take some frames from your hive if you find they're building up to the point where where it's time to split your hive. So bees in the springtime will build up when there's lots of flowers around, and it's not um it's it's a perfectly natural thing that happens, and if you don't want another colony, somebody else surely will, and uh, be happy to come and and um, take some frames out, which will limit your hive from expanding and um, swarming. So that's what I would suggest and um, they'll even pay you money to, to take um, some bees and take a split from your hive. So, so it's a wonderful thing. St Chris is asking, they're getting the, they've got the brood box ready to go and the nuke's arriving this weekend, but it's actually forecasted to rain. Is it a good idea to put it in or should they wait for the weather to clear up? I think wait. If you've got a nucleus, just put it in the location where you want your hive to be and it, you could wait you could wait a week wait a month it doesn't really matter just choose a nice time um, when you want to transfer those bees to your brood box look after them and they'll grow from there um, having said that the only caveat on that would be if um, it's particularly in the springtime if they're really building up fast and they're overflowing that little nuke box you'd want to transfer them more quickly. Jeremy from South Carolina, uh, they may have similar temperature to us actually, because their concern is that they're in a very humid climate. Are there anything they need to, want to look out for with their hives? Uh, the humidity often brings with it the, um, the hive beetles. So humid areas get more of those little black beetles we were talking about earlier. So I would activate your pest management, however you plan to do that. The flow hive twos have that tray in the bottom here we were looking at earlier. You can put some vegetable oil in there and catch some of those beetles um, 
which tend to be more prevalent in the humid times. And you can catch those beetles in this tray area. Um, otherwise, those humid um, subtropical or tropical zones, fantastic for bees because there's generally really long seasons with flowering happen happening, coming and going all year round. Here we can leave our super on all year and we can actually harvest hon honey all year round because we're close to the coast here and we get a lot of winter flowers in the heathland. So that makes it, um, makes it easy for the bees. Cass uh, Selwood's joining us from South Australia um, and they missed last week's session but they're just wondering, they're wanting to um, establish their hives but their area of course was hit really bad by bushfires. Any advice that you think for them to getting their, their um, hive started? Hey Cass, is this the Cass Selwood I went to school with? Yeah, <laughs> okay. it is Cass Selwood. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, nice to hear from you. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. I guess that the, the opinions on that will come from the local beekeepers. Sometimes you can get in a situation where you had quite bad fires um, around in the, the nightcap area and stone behind the camera ac actually hives did quite well all through the fire time because the fires didn't burn all of the forest. They, they burnt it all on one side of the valley. So it depends really whether your bees have access to flowers or not. And um, you might be able to tell that just from what vegetation is left. But um, the other thing that can happen is you can get a whole lot of species coming up after the fires that will flower in the springtime. So fingers crossed, you get a, a really nice spring coming, particularly if you've had some rain. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> He's saying nice to see you too. Fred's wanting to know what kind of things can you find out about your colony seed of the way you sort of looked in the bottom tray there a minute ago? Okay, so um, the, there's interesting things you can, you can notice from the tray. It's, um, it's more useful than I would have thought because conventionally uh, we didn't use screen bottom boards or trays and it's kind of been more popular in the USA and it's kind of a new thing to Australia. But in the uh, in that pest management tray, you can tell things like if you, if you see the hive beetle larvae in there, the tiny little grubs worming around, you can, you can tell an early infection of hive beetle. And that can be really helpful in order to know whether you've got to um, really catch those beetles and get on top of that quickly. You can um, also tell things like if there's a whole lot of white flecks of wax there when there's a, a whole lot of new bees in the hive and they're testing out their wax glands, they're making a little bit of wax and they're experimenting with it and often it falls through to the screen on the bottom and through to the, uh, to the tray. So that will tell you that there's a whole lot of new bees just about to do their orientation flights and, and, and start to um, take on the many chores that happen inside a hive. And one of them is producing wax. Um, you can also see the top of a silk um, cocoon, which you can actually see in this one here. You can see there's the there's been a bunch of oh here's something I, I can I can tell. See these flakes of yellow wax here. You can see that um, they're actually the capping. So that's showing the bees are a bit hungry, and that's why. And we can tell that from looking in the windows as well. And that's why we need to um, not harvest too much of their honey. So we're just going to harvest this one frame today and leave the rest for the bees. That, that wax is torn off cappings of the honey comb and showing they're decapping it to eat that honey. Um, there's also, you can sometimes see the top of the silk cocoons as the emerging brood have chewed them away. Um, and you can sometimes see wax moth that'll get up there and go after the wax in the bottom of the tray. Um, and if you're in a country with varroa mites, luckily we don't have that in Australia, but you can use that tray to look and count the little red dots, which are those mites that can get on the bees. You want to make sure those numbers aren't getting out of hand in your colony. 
Great questions, keep them coming in. Um, we've got time for a few more. Oh, fantastic. Michelle's wondering, there's a noticeable amount, um, or not so many bees in the area, and just wondering, how would a virgin queen find a drone congregating area to mate? Ah, that's a, <laughs> that's a great question. So, the, uh, the virgin queen will take off from the hive, and she'll do that usually in the first week or so after emerging out of her cell. And she might take off on, on a number of days to mate. And she typically flies out to an area, often it's like a, a bit of a, a clearing in the forest, it's an oval shaped um, zone, or they'll, they'll often be on the, on the lower parts. And you might expect a drone congregation area to be down lower in, the, in this valley. And drones from all of the beehives around will meet in one of these areas and hang out waiting for a queen to fly by. And then there's this extraordinary thing that happens and it's, I've, I've witnessed it a few times in the little valley where I live, where you've got this, this high speed chase on and it's whipping around the valley and it, it looks kind of aquatic the way that all of the drones kind of close in on the queen and then spread apart again like this and close in and spread apart and the whole thing's like spinning and moving and flying past and actually had the dark as it's, <laughs> as it's going by. It's like really, really quite something, but it's a, a rare thing to see. Now, it's a great question you raise. If there are no other bees, honeybees in the area, how could they mate? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, it's, um, but you'll be surprised where there is honeybees. They'll be around, they'll be in tree hollows in the forest, they'll be in um, all sorts of places. So, so um, I don't think you'll have a problem. I haven't heard of that causing an issue, but I guess if, if you're really um, pioneering bees in a totally new area that doesn't have any at all, I guess you're right. There could be an issue with uh, the queen finding some drones to mate with. Thanks, Cedar. A couple you, of people just wondering, if you're setting up a hive, do you need to plant flowers around your hive or how far away will the bees forage? Just add a little bit more to that other interesting oh, question. Oh, sorry, Cedar. And, and that is, is uh, the, generally, if you're buying in some bees, the queen will be already mated. And when you order a queen in the mail, the queen will be already mated. So that's another way. To, um, to address that issue. As far as planting flowers go, it's not something that's necessary. You'll see a lot of beekeepers, especially commercial ones, just putting bees out in the paddock. The reason why we plant flowers is partly for the, beauti uh, the beautiful thing of having flowers around, but it also attracts all of the, the native little pollinators, which it's wonderful to see. And we've got countless beautiful images of the native pollinators that come into these flowers in the garden as well. Because in the end, we, we want to stand up not only for the European honeybee, but all of those really important pollinators that make the world go round. And without them, you know, we'd lose this piece of pollination, which is so such a, a uh, important part of the whole system. So by planting flowers, especially in urban areas, you are creating stepping stones for some of those native bees who may only have a very small radius. They'll fly in just a, just a, few, uh, a few houses down, might be as far as they go. So when you plant a, a garden for pollinators, you increase their range and you might just be helping some species that are on the brink of extinction. So that's the reason we really like planting flowers and, and you get to know and appreciate which ones the bees really go for. They love purple flowers, they love the basils, they love the, um, the uh, um, almost all flowers, but you will find some that just aren't really producing nectar or pollen. But it, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing to watch and observe all of those pollinators on the flowers. That um, maybe leads into Jessica's question. She's got um, a thriving population of hoverflies and native bees in the garden and just wondering if they set up a hive, she's reluctant that they might disturb or drive out her native girls. 
Not that I'm aware of. I've, you will often see them sharing even a single flower together and there doesn't seem to be any kind of animosity between the different species. I've got uh, native bees at home, the, the, um, the sugar bag bees and as well, and you'll often see them on the flowers together. So I don't see any issues there, but um, of course there's many opinions in the world about all of that. If you've, um, if, you've, if you've got any answers to those questions, you can put them in the comments as well. Cedar, uh, Holly's wanting to know, if the brood box is full, instead of adding a super, could you do a split instead? You, you, um, you can do, and it depends a bit on your strategy. Some beekeepers who are keeping bees to breed them will be splitting before they've filled a single box. So they'll just keep splitting and splitting and splitting and building up because they're then, then selling those bees to other people. So, so you certainly can, but um, normally if you're going for a honey harvest, you'll want to build them up till they're, they're filling a couple of boxes full before you'll actually get uh, a honey harvest happening. So um, you really need a lot of bees in your hive and a good nectar flow to get a honey harvest. So if, you, if that's what you're wanting to do, then I wouldn't be splitting until uh, your hive like this is start, starting to really bulge out the front. There's a big bee ball uh, starting to develop at the front entrance. Um, this is a question, Cedar, I think customer support we get a lot as well as people who have class classic flow hives would love to be able to upgrade to one of your leg stands. Do you think that's something that Flow Hive will look at doing in the future? It is, it is. We're, um, we, we've heard the call for that and we're trying to uh, pack some of them out at the moment, so stay tuned. Fantastic. <laughs> Chase will be happy like, about that. I'm really all happy of these about questions that one. every day. <laughs> I'm really happy about that one. Um, there's a whole lot of people wondering where we are, Cedar. So we're in Byron Bay, Australia, it's the east, east coast of Australia. It's a subtropical region which is uh, very, um, very easy to keep bees because there's flowerings that happen all year round. However, you do get times, like now actually, where there's not a whole lot of flowers for the bees to go and get. So you still get times when there's no flowers, but generally there'll be something soon and your bees will get into them and keep filling up the frames. So quite different to the colder areas where there's a, a shorter, sharper season where, where let's say you're in Canada and you hear stories of, of so many flowers flowering at once that they're able to fill the whole box like this in a day, which is hard to believe. I've never seen anything like that. Here, the quickest we ever get it is, is you'll get the hive filling up again in a week. Very exciting when that happens, but um, on the, on the flip side, you could get six months or so where there's still a few flowers, but not enough to really start storing honey in your frames. So like any kind of agriculture, any type, kind of farming, it's really dependent on the weather and the seasons and things aligning in order for you to get a harvest. There's a lot of questions actually coming in about sugar. Should you feed your bees sugar syrup? Do we, f do we feed them sugar syrup over winter? Um, and Adam's asking, um, he's put his honey super on recently and want to help the bees build out the comb. Is it okay to feed sugar, sugar water on the honey super for a while? And if so, when should I stop to avoid having concentrated sugar water in the honey super rather than honey? I'm not quite sure where they're from actually. Okay, so they're all great questions. My answer would be, if your bees are starving, you should feed them. You don't want your bees to starve to death. In this area, we almost never feed bees. It's um, only for experimentation reasons to, to really learn about feeders and perhaps where, um, when we were developing the flow frame, we did a bunch of feeding in order to speed up the cycles of, of testing of the frames to really make sure everything was working well. Uh, but around here, there's generally flowers coming soon, so we don't need to feed. However, if you're living in one of those colder regions that gets a really long cold winter and your bees have no stores, then 
prior to winter is the best time to feed them up, make sure they've got some honey stores to, la to last. Now, you can, you can have a look in your box and see whether there's any honey stores. You can have a look in the bottom box to see whether there's any honey it should be on the outer frames. If there's none, then feeding them is a great idea. We, we did show a, um, a, a we, we did cover that topic, and if you dial back a number of videos, or, or look it up, you'll find um, I showed you how to make some easy feeders that can go on top of your hive or under the roof or, or even in another box on top of the hive. So as to answer your question about when to stop feeding them, you really don't want to get sugar in your honey. So generally when your honey collection box or boxes are on, you're not feeding your bees. So if you if the bees don't have any stores rather than feed them so honey is stored in the flow frames you might choose to add another box or even a half size box and feed them let them store honey in that for the winter some people in cold climates also successfully get their bees through the winter with just a single box also so really depends on your strategy. Talking to some local beekeepers will help you there. And any, any particular bees, Cedar, that you recommend for people to get if they're, when they're just starting out? Someone suggested Golden Italian. Golden Italian is, uh, is well, uh, the Italian bee. Some, some breeders call them Golden Italians. But the, that is a bee that is uh, supposedly great for beginners. Um, I would say whatever bees you can get hold of. And there's different traits for different bees, like the, the, um, the Caucasians, the, the dark bees, are said to be able to forage, uh, adjust the size of their colony better to what forage is around, less likely to, um, to get in a position where there's no honey left and starving. They supposedly can can grow and shrink the size of their colony to what flowers around more easily. However, it's it's um, I don't have uh, a lot of information on which bees are best. If you've got an opinion on that, put it in the comments below. But my advice would be whatever bees you can get hold of, and ideally some gentle natured bees that aren't going to. If, if you're new to beekeeping, starting with a gentle hive is easier. We always had quite aggressive hives when we were young and it's probably one of the reasons why we um, invented the flow hive because honey harvesting was not only a big disturbance to the bees uh, and, uh, and a, a labour intensive time consuming messy process but it was also quite painful with all the stings we would get. Um, keeping gentle bees You'll, you'll even see me out there with no bee suit at all, taking the top off hives and doing inspections. So, so that's the difference between aggressive bees and, and non-aggressive bees. So, so if you're ordering bees, ask your bee breeder for a nice, gentle strain of bee. And Cedar, any, any particular colour you recommend for painting hives or the roofs or there, um, that you think is better? There isn't a particular colour that lots of people have opinions on it but actually the bees <laughs> don't really care. I wouldn't paint your hive all, all black because that, the hive will get hotter. Um, so there's a little bit of uh, s some thoughts around that. However, we've got quite dark um, painted roofs here in a really hot region and there doesn't seem to be any issues caused from that. But um, white's the conventional colour um, that beekeepers are painting their hives out in the field but it really doesn't matter. You also see people painting their hives in rainbows and painting nice pictures on them. Here's some beautiful pictures here that uh, that Sarah did which if you've spoken to um, customer support you might recognise Sarah. She's also quite the artist. It's very beautiful pictures she's painted on this hive. Fantastic. Okay, we've got time for one more question. One more question, the lucky last question. 
Um, let me just have a look. There's a few people saying they've received their hives, which is fan fantastic um, as well. And just in terms of how often do you think people should be inspecting their brood, brood boxes? Okay, how often you need to inspect your brood box really depends on the location. So, so it, around here the demands are less than in a country that has varroa mites. So the information of how often is going to come from your local beekeepers. But you can in, expect to do a full brood inspection at least a couple of times a year. When you get in here you take out all the frames and you check for pests and disease issues in your brood box. And in those areas with the mites, you'll want to do it far more frequently, depending on your strategy of dealing with those little mites. And if you're new to beekeeping, then you might want to get a mentor. You might want to um, study up online. If you have a look at thebeekeeper.org, it's an initiative we've put together to get a wealth of information from a lot of uh, experts in a lot of different different topics in beekeeping. It's free to try if you really want to sink your teeth into some in-depth knowledge and you also get the opportunity to, to ask questions directly on Facebook live streams to, to different experts from around the world. So that could be a good place to go to ask those questions if you really want to, uh, um, to take it up the next next level. We also have a lot of free information in videos and we're here each week to answer questions. Thank you very much for tuning in. It's, it's, a, um, it's a wonderful thing and if we look after the bees, of course, it's um, only then that we get this beautiful reward of